I'm Ryan Ruskin, I'm the second vice chair of the club and uh, would like to welcome you officially to the 16th discussion series led by the Henry Crown Fellows of the Aspen Institute. We're returning to our original topic we started 16 years ago on Aristotle about what makes a good life and, and a discussion about happiness. I think that's a relevant topic to return to as we um, are emerging in from uh, global pandemics and global issues that we didn't think we would see necessarily um, in our lifetimes and we thought we might have addressed. And so I think as we look forward and we have an optimistic view of the world, it'll be great to reconsider these questions together as a group. Now I'd like to introduce fellow member, uh, tonight's host who founded this program, uh, Charlie Bobrinskoy, vice chairman and head of the investment group at Aerial Investments. And Charlie, you've done an amazing job for 15 years, so we're thrilled to continue Continue the process. We're sort of rebooting, but we're taking a fresh look at an old classic, and I appreciate you leading us tonight. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Ryan. We took two years off for COVID, and now we're delighted to be restarting. So let's talk about Aristotle. This is a famous painting by Raphael called The School of Athens. And the bearded gentleman in the middle on our left is Plato pointing up. And the dark bearded gentleman on the left in the middle is sort of pointing down to earth. And the idea here is that Plato is interested in ideas in the universe, ideas that are universal, things that don't care who gets more votes in the New Hampshire primary, a squared plus B squared is going to equal C squared no matter what humans think. Likewise, the truth about justice and honor and duty are eternal, universal ideas that exist in the universe. That's what Plato was interested in. Aristotle, our man tonight, was interested more. You can almost hear him say, that's nice, Plato, but let's talk about things down here on Earth. And so uh, Aristotle is going to be talking about things like how does an arrow fall to the ground? How does an octopus reproduce? Believe it or not, he had a chapter on that topic. How do you make a good argument or a good friend? So Plato is the philosopher of eternal truth. Aristotle is the philosopher of everyday life. By the way, I should have said up front, again, there are a lot of you who know more about Aristotle than I do, my job is sort of tonight to try to get us all to the same introductory level, the basics, not to give you answers, just sort of uh, uh, an introduction for dummies from a dummy on Aristotle. All right. So let's just some basics of his life. He was born in 384 in Macedonia. Macedonia is just north of Greece, east of Italy, uh, maybe... Uh, the center of Macedonia, maybe 80 miles north of the northern border of Greece. His father was a doctor to the king of Macedonia. He was then sent to Athens to study under Plato. Remember that Plato studied under Socrates, so goes Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Spa, is how you remember that. Uh, the academy was really a location, the word academy, uh, Peter, means it's just a location. I don't think it means school. Um, when Plato died, Aristotle was kind of hoping to get the job as the head of the academy. He didn't get it. He got passed over. So he went back to Macedonia and um, started, became the tutor to Alexander the Great, that Alexander the Great, the conqueror of the known world. And as we're going to talk about in a second, there are a couple of anecdotes about how uh, Aristotle developed his theory of virtue, talking and explaining to uh, Alexander the Great. So then he returns to Athens and forms a competing institution called the Lyceum, which I think means school. My Greek is really bad. Um, but it became a similar uh, organization to the academy. And at, I should say that the books that we have by Aristotle are not really authored books by Aristotle. They're collections of notes from his lectures. So the way to think of this is that he had students who kind of followed him around the Lyceum. They talked. Uh, Aristotle gave thoughts. 
and people wrote notes that were later collected into books. Uh, the Nicomachean uh, Ethics is a book named after uh, Aristotle's son, Nicomedeus. All right, so when Alexander died, and this is where the history gets a little bit complicated, Alexander had unified and conquered the known world, including Persia, modern Iran. And there were, if you remember the movie 300, there were hard feelings towards the Persians toward, from the Greeks. And so uh, when, when Alexander died, there was an, an anti-Macedonian um, Persian movement within Athens. And Aristotle became worried that he was, there was going to be a roundup of Macedonians. And so he fled Athens. And his famous quote was, I will not allow Athenians to sin twice against philosophy, meaning the Athenians had poisoned Socrates um, in punishment for uh, his teachings and for corrupting the youth of Athens, and, and uh, Aristotle thought they were going to find him guilty and poison him. So he fled back to uh, Macedonia. Very importantly, after he died, um, he kind of faded away until he was discovered by uh, Muslims and his works were translated into Arabic. And it really is fair to say that Islam uh, preserved the teachings of Aristotle until Thomas Aquinas and the Catholic Church adopted Aristotle. And the uh, Muslim scholars refer to Aristotle as the teacher, the first teacher. Uh, he really is to this day respected and admired uh, in the Muslim intellectual community, as he is in the Catholic community, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, he was particularly um, influential with Thomas Aquinas, who was trying to merge faith and reason, faith and science, and prove that they were not incompatible, and Aquinas taught uh, Aristotle to the Catholic Church, and we're going to show how the Catholic Church adopted many of the definitions and teachings of Aristotle, and it became part of official dogma and doctrine of the Catholic Church. Okay, so we're going to be focusing on ethics and Aristotle and ethics tonight, but I want you just, I'm going to give you just a taste of some of the other teachings he did in science. He was incredibly influential in zoology and biology, physics. I took a history, I took a history of physics class at, at Duke in which we learned that basically physics was Aristotle's teaching uh, for 1,300 years from 300 BC to at least Galileo. His teachings were conventional wisdom within physics. Uh, we'll go through that in a second. He wrote a book on rhetoric that sounds a lot like how to... Uh, influence people, make friends and influence people. I'm going to walk you through some of the main headlines from that book on rhetoric. He did a book on theater that was very influential. Um, so one thing that some people say is that he was the creator of modern science, and I want to talk about that. He, he prob probably not is my answer. You may feel differently. Some people would say Francis Bacon, who developed the... Um, scientific method. The reason you, I would argue that uh, Aristotle was not the inventor of modern science is he didn't actually do experiments. He never set, had a hypothesis which suggested an experiment, the results of which would either confirm or reject the hypothesis. But what he did do, which was new, was to learn and study through observation. And that's very different from before Aristotle. Before Aristotle, it was all science by deduction. Plato and Socrates would say things like, if X is true and Y is true, doesn't that pr prove that Z must be true? That's deduction. It's different from what we do today with experiments. But what Aristotle did, and by the way, we shouldn't look down our nose at deduction. Einstein developed the theory of relativity through deduction. He, he thought about people in elevators in space falling. He thought about trains going at the speed of light past embankments and what that would do to time. And he developed the theory of relativity completely through deduction. So there's nothing wrong with deduction. But what Aristotle was the first scientist to do was to collect data. And I would argue he was actually 
um, the first data scientists. And when we think about what artificial intelligence and machine learning do, what do they do? They collect data and look for patterns. That's what Aristotle did. He didn't start with a hypothesis and test it with an experiment. He collected data and looked for patterns. And we're going we're to see that. And to that extent, we can regard him as the creator of modern science. OK, so in, in zoology, he uh, was the first to classify living things. He, he classified over 500 species. He used the word species. And his uh, classification was instead of invertebrates and vertebrates, it was more around blood, around with blood, without blood, cold-blooded, warm-blooded was a distinction that he made. He did, however, believe in the hierarchy, hierarchy of living things. And so he had man at the top. Probably modern zoology wouldn't have a hierarchy of living things. So that would be how he differed from modern world. But he was the first person to classify different living species through um, classification. In physics, this is what I, I found this amazing when I took this class in, in college. He started with believing that all matter consisted of five elements in different components. Earth, water, air, and fire. So my favorite band, Earth, Wind, and Fire, comes from Aristotle's elements. These five still exist to this day. And the names have changed to matter, liquid, gas, and plasma, as a form, fire is a form of plasma. The only one that's been now rejected in modern science is ether. So we had the Michelson-Morley experiments in the 1880s that proved that there's no such thing as ether. From 384 BC until 1887, the scientific community believed there was an ether that the moon passed through, that the earth passed through. And that's the only one of the five elements that's to this day been disproven. Now, his theory was that each element had a natural direction of motion. So all things made of earth wanted to go down. And if you held a stone and took away the force, it would move in its natural, excuse me, direction. Same thing for water. Water's natural direction was down. Air's natural direction was up. Fire's natural direction was up. And the degree to which things moved up and down was the degree to which they were made of water or earth. And if something was heavily dense with earth, it would move down faster. That was his theory, which was not disproved until uh, Galileo and his vacuum. Now, the ether was circular, which is the or ether moved in a circle, which is why the sun moved around the earth and why the moon moved around the earth. So elements each sought their natural state, and matter seeks to come to rest if thrown. An arrow thrown, Aristotle argued, would seek to come to a rest. It was only Newton. 1600s, 1800 years later, who changed that to say that matter in motion will continue in motion until it meets a force. So his, these theories lasted for 1800 years. Maybe you'd argue Galileo put an end to it, but they were incredibly, they were the dominant theory in physics for, hit for 1800 years. All right, he was the creator of the science of, re of rhetoric. He observed, as a lot of people have, that the best argument didn't al always win. There were the sophists who, today we say sophistry is bad argument. The sophists were a group at the time that taught how to win arguments. And they, in Aristotle's view, were teaching bad outcomes. People who were good at arguing were winning the arguments. And so Aristotle wrote a book on rhetoric. And he developed certain techniques. The, uh, again, a lot of this is similar to what you find in modern rhetoric books. The first is understand the fears of the people you're talking to and how to soothe them. Use humor to make a point. Don't think that the best technical argument is always going to win. And he was, he's got these pages, he's got five pages on the importance of illustration and example. All right, and lastly, I'll just be quick on this. There's a book called The Poetics where he lays out the rules of tragedy in theater. 
The first rule is the peripatia, how you have to have a change in fortune, how things have to start out good for the hero, and then things go from great to bad. It has to be in all tragedy, according to Aristotle. So think Leo DiCaprio in Titanic. He's got uh, Winslet, and then everything's looking great, and then it hits the fan. That's peripatia. Anagnorisis. I'm going to look at Peter. Uh, that's the moment of dramatic reveal, the big reveal. Uh, Aristotle said every act of tragedy must have that in the play. Luke, I am your father. That's, parap- that's uh, anagnorisis. All right. Now let's get to ethics. And this is why we're going to concentrate on the rest. That's sort of a summary. I would just want you to have a feel. This person influenced so many fields of science. And we're going to focus mostly on uh, ethics for the, the rest of my talk and then your talk at dinner. So the theory of virtue, uh, Ereti, is uh, unlike Plato and Socrates, who if you've ever read them, you often get frustrated that they ask the questions all the time and never give you an answer. So Socrates walks around and says, what is justice? And, and then challenges the person or dissects the person's answer and never tells you what Socrates thinks justice is. That's what I love about Aristotle is that he tells you what he thinks. And maybe if there was just one sentence I'd love for you to remember from this night about uh, Aristotle is his theory of virtue. Every word in this sentence is important and has survived. And it is that virtue is the habit of choosing the golden mean between the vices of character extremes. If you just do something once, that's not virtue, that's not even virtuous, until you develop the habit, having doing it over and over again, being taught by your schooling, by your parents, by your society. This is habituation. You have to learn these habits in order to be virtuous. What do we mean by the golden mean between extremes? He said that the virtue of courage is the golden mean between the two extremes of cowardice and rashness. And this is where the story of Aristotle and Alexander the Great comes in. Supposedly, uh, Aristotle was talking to Alexander the Great about courage, and he said, imagine you have a soldier who is rash and charges the enemy by himself. He gets cut down in five seconds. Is he any help to the cause? No, he's not. Imagine another soldier who's a coward, who sees the enemy and he runs the other direction. Is he any help to the uh, the cause? No, he's not. The virtue is the courageous soldier who is best, who has the appropriate respect for danger, but is not immobilized by it. So that's the golden mean between the extremes. And he wasn't afraid to call these extremes vices. Aristotle was no moral relativist. He said there were things that were good, courage, and things that were bad, cowardice and rashness. And he does this for each of his virtues. And he has one page, I didn't lay it out here, where he's got 12 virtues and uh, each of the extremes, and it's actually kind of fun. The translation gets a little funny in the Greek, but it's, he's got the, the vices of, um, of each of these traits. And obviously, this is what one of the things that the Catholic Church picked up in a big way, that there are vices, they are real, they are not just um, because of convention, they are because armies win and lose battles because of them. All right, temperance is the proper median between drunkenness drunkenness, and abstention. Uh, this is where, by the way, the Catholics are much more appreciative of this than my um, teetotaling uh, Protestant friends, who the Catholics would say that Jesus turned water into wine, not the other way around. And so the right place to be is the golden mean, which is temperate, but is the median between, again, drunkenness and a complete abstention. So 
uh, Aristotle called out four cardinal virtues. And the first is, is prudence. This is the ability to choose a means of achieving a worthy end. He talked about financial uh, services in this. Investment, you can't be rash and invest all your money in risky ventures. You can't be overly afraid and put all your money in under your mattress. You have to invest in a prudent manner. And this word obviously survives to this day. That's why prudential insurance is called what it is. This idea of choosing habits to get you to the worthy end is one of the four cardinal virtues. The second is justice, the habit of treating people in a way they should be treated. Not overly harsh, not giving everybody a pass, in the golden mean between those two. And he has a wonderful couple of pages uh, in the ethics on the, what happens to a society or to a recipient of either too harsh justice or not enough justice that it is not in anybody in that society's best interest. The third cardinal virtue is temperance, which we've really talked about. It's not just um, drink. It's the moderation and use of all sources of pleasure. Temperance is that golden mean, um, everything in moderation. And finally, fortitude, which is like courage but is broader. It's your ability to keep going in the face of not just danger, but difficulty. So fortitude is grit. It's not giving up too soon, not banging your head against the wall. It's having the right um, degree of grit to keep going. Those are the four most important virtues. They're called character virtues to Aristotle. Now, I'm going to compare them. The Catholics loved this idea when Aquinas got around, but they had a couple of alterations they wanted to make. And they said, uh, temperance in regarding sex, we want to go to chastity. We want to move down that scale. Um, charity, they wanted to move the other direction. Jesus obviously told his, there were a couple of parables about people giving away everything. So the Catholic Church wanted to move more towards giving away more. Um, humility rather than pride. Aristotle considered pride a virtue, that you should be proud of what you do. The Catholic Church preferred the humility of Jesus and so substituted some different virtues but kept the framework very much the same. All right, eudaimonia, and I, I, we're getting close to the end here. Eudaimonia is a critical word it is the word that's translated as happiness. When, when uh, Mortimer Atler or when Thomas Jefferson wrote The Pursuit of Happiness, there, were, there was a translation of the word eudaimonia. It's usually translated happiness. I think that's caused a lot of misunderstanding in Western culture and English culture because people hear happiness and they think be happy, be fun, be carefree. That is not what Aristotle meant by happiness. It means probably the better translation is fulfillment, achievement of potential. That's happiness as eudaimonia. So uh, what is the best life of a human, Aristotle asked? Well, he started by saying what is not the best. And the, the most common answers are wealth, honor, or bodily pleasure. That's what should be pursued. And, and Aristotle attacked all three. He said, wealth is a means to an end. If you just achieve wealth for that end and you sit, a miser sits on a pile of gold, that is not a good life. It's, an end to a, uh, it's a means to an end. The phrase means to an end comes from Aristotle. Honor is only how other people perceive you. And you can fool other people. And so that's not necessarily a good life. And finally, bodily pleasure is not particular to humans. All animals are trying to eat a lot of food and have sex. And that's not, that's a life fit for cattle. The critical point here is, now this is, that each thing in the universe has a purpose, a unique best use. And fulfillment of that potential is eudaimonia. So a Stradivarius violin can be used as a hammer. 
but that is not its best and highest use, which is creating beautiful music. My Peloton bike is a wonderful clothes rack. That is not the best use for that bike. And here, this almost starts to sound like Adam Smith in competitive advantage. It is, you get into trouble when you start using things in ways other than their best use, the thing that brings out their most potential. That's competitive advantage that Adam Smith talks about. All right, so the highest and best use of humans is reason. It's the one thing that we can do that other species can't do. And it, modern scientists like to talk about how we're 99% the same as chimpanzees. Aristotle was, said that's nonsense. And Aristotle would say that a, a chimpanzee cannot put a man on the moon, cannot create medicine. Two chimpanzees can't even lift a log to build a house. Humans can reason, can discover, can develop character. That is the best use of human, is reasons and pursuing those virtues. All right, there are two types of virtues. There are intellectual virtues, which is basically science, discovery, all of the uh, learning about the universe. That is a virtue. And the second are those character virtues that we talked about, courage, temperance, and justice. So the best life is acquiring both the intellectual virtues and the character virtues because it is the fulfillment of what humans can do, human potential. And he closes your readings with this statement, a life guided by intelligence is the best life and most pleasant for man inasmuch as intelligence is man. This kind of life is the happiest, read, most fulfilling. All right, that's what he thought. Now, that doesn't mean you have to think that. So you may have a different opinion. First of all, both he and Mortimer Adler say that you can't figure out whether it's been a good life or not until the end. They use the example of the football game. I used to think you could say in the middle of a football game that you'd played a good football game so far. And then we had the Chiefs and the Buffalo Bills the other night, and now I think you can't tell whether you played a good game until it's over. So. Aristotle and Mortimer Adler say the deathbed scene, the deathbed test. You have to be looking at your deathbed and think, what has to be true about my life for me to be able to say I've lived a good life? That's the deathbed test, and you can't pass it until you get to the end of your life. You can live your life thinking about that dead deathbed, deathbed test, but you can't know the answer until you get there. Now, are there other answers that people have come up with? Obviously, a lot of scientists today believe that all living creatures have one purpose, and that's to pass down their genes, that they are selfish genes, and that they, that's why they exist. There's no such thing as good or bad. It's just survival. And I don't, I'm, this is why I'm an Aristotelian. I think that's nonsense. I think Aristotle's right, but you should talk about it at dinner. Some people think it's all about being remembered for doing great works. Uh, that's what a founding fathers were all very interested in, in making a name for themselves. And then obviously a lot of people think this is all about entering heaven. So we'll, we can talk about all of those views over dinner. And then the last question is just how do we feel about the phrase pursuit of happiness as a translation of what Aristotle was talking about? I, again, I think it's caused years of confusion. I don't think Thomas Jefferson was saying you have a right to be happy or you get a right to go to parties or uh, that's nonsense. He was saying you have a right to be able to pursue fulfilling your potential.